Great to see you this morning. Nice to have a good day, isn't it? I mean, look at the sunshine. You know, it was uh, so bright in our uh, 9 o'clock service, we actually had to put our black plastic up over the stained glass window. We don't like to do that, but it, it washes out the screen, and you can't see anything on the screen if we don't. So it's awesome to have some good weather. Well, we've been uh, continuing here in our Hungering for Holiness series, which is based on a couple of really powerful psalms. And uh, I want to just tell you, there is no better place to go for insights about holiness than the book of Psalms. These Psalms were written by people who knew God and who walked with Him in a close relationship. I want to take a moment to thank Pastor Dave for doing such a great job with Psalm 22 last week. Uh, I was in San Diego. I know you feel sorry for me having to be exiled down there. Uh, but I was doing some teaching in a denominational program that we call Sustaining Pastoral Excellence. And then I uh, stayed on through Thursday for the Covenant Midwinter Pastors Conference, which was in San Diego this year. And um, I want to say, too, that most of our pastoral staff was able to attend uh, because being on the West Coast, um, the airfares were really great. Matter of fact, uh, because we wanted all seven of our pastors to go, we um, had a little contest to see who could get the lowest airfare. Now, tomorrow, we're going to compare notes and see what happens, but Pastor Dan, I think I've got you beat. I really do. So I'm looking forward to... Uh, to when we find that out. And uh, we also stayed at the Budget Hotel next to the really nice conference center. Um, I think that the walk, though, was probably good for us, don't you? I think the exercise was good, yeah. So that was a good thing. Um, we heard from some excellent inspirational speakers, uh, and we also participated in professional growth workshops. Uh, the ministry, just like lots of other walks of life, you know, you kind of need to keep up on new things that are developing and compare notes with other people who do the same thing you do. Uh, so um, we had those chances and uh, that was really great. We thank our congregation for making that a priority. It's been tough for us to do, so we, it's been a few years since our staff has gotten to go to something like that, but it was really great and we thank you for making that a priority. I want to mention too before I move on that um, on Saturday at 1 o'clock, we will have J.B. Still's memorial service right here in our worship center. So uh, put that on your schedule. I know many of you knew J.B. Uh, he sat right back here in front of the sound booth at normally our uh, 9.30 service. And we are sorry to uh, have to release him and let him go, but we're delighted that he's in the presence of the Lord. And please do remember his wife, Carmen in your prayers. Well, today we're looking at Psalm 42, and we're going to talk about the issue of prayer in holiness. These two things, prayer and holiness, are closely linked together. Psalm 42 is really a prayer. It is a rich, deep prayer. It's the kind of prayer that just draws us in, and we feel like we're part of it. We get wrapped up in it. And it also teaches us a lot about prayer, and that's important. Now, this particular psalm, even though we're tempted to think maybe David wrote it, we can't be sure because there's no name on the earliest manuscripts. But it's very clear that whoever wrote it, it was a person who knew God well and who was at ease talking with God, pouring out his heart before God speaking transparently. Prayer and the eagerness to pray is one of the basic foundations for holiness. We've been defining holiness as behaving like God, honoring and obeying God in all the circumstances of our lives. Now, I just want to tell you, that is a tall order when you say, I want to obey God in all the circumstances of my life. And if we're going to accomplish that, we need God's help. And God's help, God's intervention in our lives, God's presence in our lives is accessed through prayer. For holiness to show up, prayer has to occupy a very central place 
in our lives. And that means getting comfortable with spending time alone with God in prayer. Psalm 42 was written by somebody who knew how to do that. We've also been using Calvin Miller's book called A Hunger for the Holy. We still have copies of this at the worship, out at the Welcome Center if you want to pick one up. Uh, he's got a great chapter in there about prayer. One of the most powerful chapters I've read outside of the scripture itself. And I want to utilize some of his insights today. In your bulletin, you'll notice that there's a special prayer brochure uh, that we're going to use to guide our praying this coming week. I want you to take that home and let that guide your prayers. I'll talk a little bit more about that at the end of the message. But we're going to ask everybody to make a commitment to prayer this week. All right, now each week we have been giving you a memory verse, okay? So I want to ask if anybody has the one ready that Pastor Dave gave us last week. Now I'll just tell you, it comes from Deuteronomy 31.8 and it starts with the words, the Lord, okay? Now if you can remember this one, I mean if you can stand up and recite it, you know, that's going to be great. You're going to show up everyone who is at the 930 service, okay? Because none of them could do it. We have Pastor Dan right over here with the microphone. He needs some exercise. He's willing to walk or run around the sanctuary. Anybody got that? Raise your hand. Anybody have that at all? No? Nobody? Is this going to be like the last service? We have somebody over here? Where are we? All right. Way over there, Pastor Dan. All right. You're going to have to find it. Deuteronomy 31.8. The Lord will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be discouraged. No, do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. All right. Now, we, that's a great job. Let's show our appreciation to Sherry for that. That was awesome. Good. Anybody else have it? We're always willing to have two. If you're in the balcony and you've got it, you just have to stand up. Pastor Dan told me I don't do balconies with the microphone. So, all right. Anybody? Okay. Good job, Sherry. Way to go. Thank you. That's great. All right. Well, today as we look at Psalm 42, I want us to notice four characteristics of the kind of prayer that will keep us growing in holiness. Each of these characteristics forms a lesson we can learn from, all right? Now, raise your hand if you wish you prayed less. You thought I was going to say more, didn't you? Raise your hand if you wish you prayed less. In other words, if you feel like I have got a problem, it's called I pray too much. I just pray all the time. Okay, anybody got that problem? See, I would say that's a good problem. All right, and I would say congratulations if that's your situation. But most of us feel like, hey, I don't pray enough. I need to pray more. So that's what we want to work on today. All right, here's the first characteristic I want you to notice in Psalm 42. We're connecting everything with holiness. Notice that passion is expressed, all right? Write this down. Holiness starts with passion for God. Holiness starts with passion for God. Listen to verses 1 and 2. As the deer longs for streams of water, so I long for you, O God. I thirst for God, the living God. When can I go and stand before him? We learn a lot just in those words. The image of a deer longing for streams of water is a powerful image, isn't it? I mean, just let that one be in your mind for a few moments. A deer has to find good, reliable sources of water to survive. You know that. It's a daily necessity. And when it does, it drinks deeply and it returns to that source time and again. Holiness starts with a longing, a longing for the presence of God who is accessed through prayer. Our psalmist says he thirsts, he thirsts for the living God. You know what it feels like to be thirsty. It drives us to find water. It starts out maybe as a, a feeling in our mouths, you know, and it's, 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 a, it's discomfort. Uh, but our bodies also have a way of knowing when we need more moisture, we need water. And it becomes dangerous, doesn't it, if we can't find a good source of water. I mean, our bodies can actually last quite a bit longer without food than they can without water. 
And in a lot of parts of the world where people do not have clean water to drink, they drink unsafe water, they get sick, many die, lots of children die of waterborne diseases because they drink unclean water. That's one of the reasons that we're getting behind Van and Janice Hubbard's efforts to drill water wells in Sierra Leone, where they are now. They drilled many wells in Afghanistan, and now they've gone to Sierra Leone, and they're working hard to drill wells. We, have a, as a congregation, have a goal of um, drilling one of those wells, paying the cost. It's about $9,000. It's more expensive in Africa than other parts of the world. And this was explained to me. There's a layer of rock you have to go through, about six feet deep, which makes it more expensive and more difficult. But providing clean water is one of the most loving, caring things we can do in the name of Jesus to help suffering people and uh, people in poverty in the world. So I want to also add my challenge to what you've been hearing. Uh, I think that's a great way to go about this. Um, uh, just count the number of times you turn on your tap each day to get clean water for whatever use you have for it. Maybe figure out what the average is, but then multiply that times one or five or ten and make that a donation to drill a water well in Sierra Leone. For the follower of Christ, we have only one direct source of spiritual strength, God. Nothing about our lives can take shape the way God wants if we don't pray. The best, deepest, most focused prayers arise from our passion for God. Passion expressed through prayer. Now, here's the interesting part. Most followers of Christ say they highly value prayer and they are committed to it. Yet, you know where this is going. According to surveys, we actually spend very little time talking with God. For some reason, we find it much easier to talk about prayer than to actually pray. Think about it. You've been in Bible study groups, prayer groups, where you went around the group and you took prayer requests, and that took 20 or 25 minutes, and then you had five minutes in prayer. I think we might be better off just to say, uh, look, just pray your prayer requests, and we'll all hear them as you pray them. Calvin Miller in his book says, prayer itself is not hard, but the will to pray is. And then he quotes a preacher who wrote this, I find it easier to preach on prayer than to pray. I find it easier to write on prayer than to pray. I find it easier to talk about Jesus than to pray. I find anything I do in my Christian life easier than praying. And man, does that describe about 95% of the Christians that I talk to about the subject of prayer. Why is it that when it's time to just really settle in for some prayer, there are so many distractions? Have you noticed this? We remember that there's an urgent phone call that we just got to make. It's only going to take two minutes. It takes four or five. We think, oh, I left something in the car. I got to go get it. We hear the ping or whatever sound you have that, you know, goes off when you receive a text. You say, well, I got to read it and then reply. We hear something on the TV that interests us. So, you know, we hustle into the next room. We turn it up and learn What's going on with uh, the big storm in the Northeast? We see a headline in the newspaper and it just grabs our attention, so we pause to read the article. A cat walks through the room and we remember, hey, we haven't fed the cat yet today, so we pause to do that. That half an hour that we set aside for prayer is now down to 15 minutes, and guess what? The distractions aren't done yet. It's too hot or too cold in the room. We've got to adjust the thermostat. 
there's a knock on the door and we need to tell the Jehovah's Witnesses that we don't want any of their literature but we gotta let them do a little bit of their spiel first because we don't want to be rude finally we settle in for our time of prayer and there's only five minutes left before we have to leave and go pick up the kids after school where did the time go what happened well we had good intentions but the passion to be with God in his presence just wasn't there it was missing holiness starts with passion for God here's the next one distress is identified in this psalm notice the psalmist mentions what has him so upset I mean what is so frustrating and distressing listen to this verse 2 I thirst for God for the living God when can I go and stand before God in verse 3 he mentions that his enemies are taunting him you ever have this happen where you know people criticize you for following Christ or put you down I know it happens I know some people experience that quite a bit in the places that they work or maybe in school all right but then listen to verse 4 my heart is breaking as I remember how it used to be I walked among the crowds of worshipers leading a great procession to the house of God singing for joy and giving thanks amid the sound of a great celebration so we have a pretty good picture of what's going on this is somebody who remembered being able to go to the temple in Jerusalem and worship God and he remembers how wonderful that was but he's been cut off from that he can't do it anymore have to remember that for Jews the proper place to worship God was at the temple that's been taken away maybe the temple's been destroyed maybe this is one of those periods of time when you know Israel was conquered by a foreign enemy and all the people were carted off into slavery in another nation but it hurts so deeply that he cannot go to the temple and worship God with a great throng of people who share his faith it kind of makes you wonder what he would say about all the reasons we come up with for missing our Sunday morning worship opportunities oh there was a big game on TV oh my kids had a soccer game oh it worked out to be a bad hair day for me let me tell you something about bad hair days okay don't give me that I got a bad hair day every day get used to it get over it all right you can live with it all right this psalmist is sort of like uh, remember the old uh, Joni Mitchell song don't it always seem to go that you don't know what you've got till it's gone that's the situation he's in a church consultant by the name of Lyle Schaller says that basically since about the turn into the 21st century really just a trend of the last 10 or 12 years what it means to be active in a church has gone from participating attending three Sundays a month to one Sunday a month in other words in these surveys they do they call up people and they say um, you know are you involved in a church and then they use words like would you consider yourself to be actively involved and if they say yes I am they say well how many Sundays per month on average do you attend before the year 2000 that usually was about three all right but since then and in more recent years that is now one on average and folks that cannot be the case without it impacting our spiritual lives to sustain a strong Christian walk we have to hear the Word of God proclaimed and we need to hear it from someone who has studied it and someone who has been directed by God's Spirit to bring a message to this group of people at this point in time and I want to tell you something I can remember things I heard in sermons 
30 years ago that have had a shaping impact on my life. I can remember who the preacher was. I can't remember the title of the sermon. I can't even remember what the whole sermon was about. But there was something God wanted to say to me in that sermon. I heard it, and it stuck with me, and it is still having an impact in my life. We need to sing these hymns and these songs because they remind us of how big and how powerful God is. And you know what happens to us during the week? We start to shrink God down. We sort of forget about God. We sort of push him to the margins of our lives. We need to come back together. And when we sing those praises, we realize how big and how great and how awesome and how mighty God is. And you know what else it does? The music lowers the defenses in our hearts and it makes it easier for God to just speak right into our lives. We need to come together with others who share our faith because in our work environment, in our school environment, in our neighborhood, sometimes we feel like, well, am I the only Christian around here? And some of you work and go to school in places where that is the reality. Then we come to church and we see lots of people and we say, wait a minute, God's got lots of people in his kingdom and I'm one of them and we need to pray together we need to agree together in prayer that these are important things in the life of our church and we need to lift those up before the Lord so don't ever ask yourself is it worth it to get up and go to church it is worth it both for you and for God God loves to see you here joining others in the body of Christ worshiping and glorifying him keep doing it and over the course of time it will have a massive impact in changing your life the psalmist is distressed about the fact that he wants to go and worship God with other believers and he can't do it and we see something else here we see that prayer is a great place to clarify what's going on within us and to discuss it with God Sometimes I find myself churning within about something that's going on, something that's happened, something that I'm anticipating will happen. I mean, I can't even always identify the source of my anxiety. I'm not sure exactly what it is, so I go to God and pray. I say, God, what is going on here? Why am I feeling this way? You know, uh, reveal this to me. Help me to find it. Help me to understand it. And when we do that, God invites us to just give it to him. To just leave it at the cross of Jesus, whatever it is. And to go forward with peace in our hearts. Here's the third characteristic I want you to notice. Discouragement is communicated. Verse 5, why am I discouraged? Why is my heart so sad? I will put my hope in God. I will praise him again, my Savior and my God. And then you go on into verse 6. Verse 6 starts in an odd place. It actually feels like it's in the middle of verse 5. But remember, these uh, numbers were not added until several thousand years after these words were written. But it says, Now I am deeply discouraged. But I will remember you, even from distant Mount Hermon, the source of the Jordan, from the land of Mount Mazar. See, one of the really healthy things happening in this prayer is that, is that the psalm writer is able to name his emotions. He's able to say, I am discouraged. And he's not holding anything back from God. Not asking God to guess what's going on within him. Folks, becoming discouraged is a common experience of life, okay? It is, it is. It's a common experience of life. Sometimes we all feel discouraged, don't we? Things just, you know, seem to pile up, build up. Maybe something has gone badly for us. Maybe something we were counting on coming through and making a difference doesn't happen. Maybe we lose our job. Maybe it's difficult to find a new one. Or somebody we love gets sick or the bills pile up. It just seems like there's trouble everywhere. You ever gone through a season of life like that? I bet you have. You feel discouraged. And you wonder, what's it going to take to get out of this emotional mess? I feel like I'm in. 
I want you to notice there is no indication the psalmist expected his circumstances to change anytime soon. This psalm was not written about, you know, something's going to get better real soon. This is a psalm about God. Help me in the midst of my troubles. In prayer, we can confess our troubles to God and we can listen for what he has to say. Folks, please remember, prayer is not one-way conversation. It goes both ways. God responds. I mean, you know, that's why it says the living God. The psalmist is not thinking about praying to some statue. The living God. God responds. God speaks, and we learn to recognize when God is speaking to us. And I will tell you this, both from my own experience and from talking to people and from reading the Scripture, God's voice is rarely audible, okay? It's rarely audible, but it is distinct and it is discernible. You can tell when God's speaking to you about something. Sometimes it comes as a correction to something that we had not really seen as wrong or we hadn't dealt with or we were in denial about it and you know, God's word just bursts through and we say, no, I can't do that anymore, that's wrong. Sometimes it's an instruction to do something differently than the path that we're on. But it stands out, you know, it stands apart from other thoughts that go through our minds. And we're able to say, you know what, God is speaking to me right now. Sometimes it comes like a bolt. It just seems to come like out of nowhere. Calvin Miller tells this story about an image he saw while he was praying for someone in his church. He's a pastor. And uh, he took that as an indication from God that he needed to go and see that person. So he went to see her, and she said that she had seen an image of him. He proceeded to tell her about Christ, and for the first time in her life, she welcomed Christ into her heart and into her life. God was at work in his prayers, telling him to go to her, and at work in her life to tell her that the pastor was going to visit her. Two weeks ago in Psalm 37, we read the promise that says, Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you your heart's desires. Well, prayer, folks, is how we live out that delight in the Lord. Prayer is one of those key places we live out that delight that we have for God. Prayer is a time and opportunity to live out our delight for God by coming into his presence and pouring out our hearts. That brings us to the last characteristic, hope is revived. Now I want you to notice how the psalmist toggles, you know, he just goes back and forth between this discouragement and feeling hopeful. Whenever he thinks about God, whenever he reflects back on God's goodness in his life, what happens? He starts to feel encouraged. His hope revives. And he confesses that under the circumstances he's in, that's all he's got. That's all he's got. These vivid memories of God's blessings in the past. That's what keeps him going. He remembers this joy he felt in walking with the worshipers to the temple. Verse 6 has more of it. Now I'm deeply discouraged, but I will remember you, even from distant Mount Hermon, the source of the Jordan, from the land of Mount Mazar. And then look down there at verse 8. But each day the Lord pours his unfailing love upon me, and through each night I sing his songs, praying to God who gives me life. See, his hope is found in focusing on God He's wise enough to know that the only path out of this discouragement is to see the many ways that God has been at work in his life in the past. And you notice what happens when he does that. He realizes God has not abandoned him. God is with him in the midst of it. I want to make verse 8 our memory verse, so lots of you will have it ready for next week, okay? 
let's put that up on the screen and let's say this a couple of times. All right, join me. But each day the Lord pours his unfailing love upon me. And through each night I sing his songs, praying to God who gives me life. One more time. But each day the Lord pours his unfailing love upon me. And through each night I sing his songs, praying to God who gives me life. That's just a great verse to remember and keep with you, especially when you're discouraged. Here's what I want us to see. Prayer is his lifeline. He cannot fix the situation that he's in. His enemies have the upper hand. Prayer is what keeps him going. And you know something? That is true of all holy people. The more we excel at prayer, the more we grow in holiness. When we pray, we find close communion with God. And that communion reminds us that we belong to God that he is present with us, that we are his representatives in the world, and that he gives us what we need to represent him well. I want to ask you this question. Does this psalm sound like it's written by somebody who is ready to just totally give up on his faith? Does it? No, it doesn't, does it? Sounds like somebody who is in deep trouble and who needs help. Sounds like someone who is in distressing circumstances, and it also sounds like somebody who has full confidence in God, and his confidence gives him hope. As we wrap up here, I want to ask you to uh, take this prayer brochure out of your bulletin today, okay? Everybody should have one. It's in your bulletin. I want to ask us as a church, all of us, to commit ourselves to pray using this brochure to guide our devotional thoughts and then to pray. Now, if you say, well, I already have some devotional material I use, just put this on top of it. Just include this with it. Let's do this. It's not that long. And there's a scripture reading. It's written by Don Taloyo, who is an associate pastor uh, at Trinity Covenant Church in Salem, Oregon. And it's excellent. Okay? Here's what I'd like to have happen, all right? I'd like for all of us to do this. I mean, to commit ourselves as a whole church to do it, to let it be one of those things we say. We're not just, you know, saying here's an individual thing or here's something that's nice. You know, maybe you'd like to use this. That we as a church commit ourselves all to use this material. Now, maybe your prayer life needs a little bit of a jump start. Maybe it's been kind of dry lately. Here's a great opportunity for that, okay? So let's all spend time with God each day this week using this material, and you can use whatever else you have to, and lift up prayer requests as they come out of this, and also the prayer requests and needs you have and you're aware of in your own life. Okay, let's commit ourselves to this. Um, I want to mention, I'm, I'm ready to wrap up, but I want to mention that um, we'll have prayer partners at the front of the service uh, following our concluding song and the blessing. Join me for a, a moment of prayer. God, it is great to be here in your presence and to worship you and to hear your word, to take a deep dive into Psalm 42 and to listen for your voice. Lord God Almighty, may this week be for all of us a week of prayer. Renew us in praying and meet us there just as you have promised to do so that we can experience your love and your presence in some really tangible ways and do some things in our lives this week that we'll want to tell others about. In Jesus' name, amen.